Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Petit Family Case The Petit family was indeed seen as a model family, fulfilling the best expectations with their stable economic background and exemplary children. They were genuinely admired by those around them. The father, William Petit, was born and raised in Connecticut and stood out in almost every sport during high school, particularly in basketball, where he was a natural leader. In addition to his athletic prowess, he was also the most intelligent of his class, as evidenced by his completion of a law degree at Dartmouth University. However, his true calling was not law. He wanted to help people, care for the sick, and make the world a better place. So, after graduating, he decided to pursue a career in medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. During his third year of residency at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, William met Jennifer Hawk, a nurse in the oncology area and co-director of the health center of a pre-graduate internship. They soon fell in love, and those who knew them affirmed they were perfect for each other. They got married in 1985. Four years later, they welcomed their first daughter, Haley, and the pregnancy spurred them to form a large family leading them to buy a house in Cheshire, Connecticut. On November 17, 1995, their second daughter, Michaela, was born. After recovering from childbirth, Jennifer continued her work as a nurse and co-director of the internship. Unfortunately, she later developed multiple sclerosis, an incurable disease she battled for the rest of her life. However, her family never ceased to support her. At the age of 10, their eldest daughter began fundraising for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, which would raise significant funds over the years. Michaela also excelled academically and planned to take over the fundraising efforts when her sister went to college to continue helping her community. She had spent the summer learning to cook and often enjoyed preparing meals for her family. Tragically, this routine activity would lead the family to a fateful encounter with their perpetrator. One July night in 2007, Michaela was preparing dinner for her family, but needed more ingredients for her recipe, so she and her mother went to the nearest market. At the same place was Joshua Komisarjevsky, who had recently been released from prison. Komisarjevsky's childhood was traumatic and complicated. Born to teenage parents, he was put up for adoption a week after birth by his mother and was adopted by the Komisarjevsky family. Known for their reputation as distinguished artists in Europe, they were a religious family and very strict with him. Despite his high IQ, he struggled in school, leading his parents to homeschool him. During his trial, he claimed that he was sexually abused by a cousin in his childhood, but his family chose to keep it quiet. This led him to develop a rebellious and chaotic personality. By the age of 14, Joshua Komisarjevsky had been accused of abusing his sister, and it was around this time that he committed his first burglary, marking the start of his career as a thief. In 2002, he was arrested for the first time on 18 charges of burglary and theft, and was subsequently sentenced to nine years in prison. During the trial, he made a chilling statement, saying, I like to listen to people while they sleep. I like the feeling of invading their privacy and security. He was released on parole in 2007 at the age of 27. Officials in charge considered him a danger to society, being a calculating criminal with perverted tendencies. However, the jury did not heed the warnings and declared Joshua ostensibly fit for release. After his release, he stayed in a residence for ex-convicts, 
where he met his accomplice, Stephen Hayes. Hayes had spent a significant portion of his life in prison, first being incarcerated at the age of 16 in the year 1980. Over the years, he was frequently arrested for violent robbery and burglary. He was sentenced in 2004 and again granted parole in 2006, which led him to the same halfway house where he met Commissar Jevsky. Returning to the night of July 22, 2007, Michaela Petit was preparing dinner for her family, but realized she needed more ingredients for her recipe. She asked her mother to take her to the nearest market to shop. Little did they know they were being observed by Commissar Jevsky, who meticulously noted every detail, the make and model of their vehicle, their faces, and Michaela's blonde hair. After shopping, the Petit family returned home, unaware that they were being followed. Shortly afterwards, Hayes sent a text message to Commissar Jevsky that read, I'm chomping at the bit to get started. Need a margarita soon. Hayes then texted, We still on. Commissar Jevsky replied, Yes. Hayes's next text asked, Soon. To which Commissar Jevsky replied, I'm putting the kid to bed hold your horses. Hayes replied, Dude, the horses want to get loose. Commissar Jevsky discreetly trailed the family in his car, learning the exact location of their home before withdrawing from the scene. The family enjoyed what seemed like a peaceful and normal dinner, unaware that it would be their last moment together. In the early hours, while everyone slept except for the father, William Petit, who had dozed off in the living room, their peace was shattered by strange noises inside the house. The next thing William remembered was a sense of grogginess, pain, and an inability to formulate a coherent thought. Commissar Jevsky and Hayes had entered the house through an unlocked door and initially planned to rob the family. However, the night took a tragic turn. They found a baseball bat in the house and used it to repeatedly beat William, who remained conscious despite the assault. He heard one of the intruders say, if he moves, shoot him. William was then tied up with zip ties and ropes, immobilized and bound to a pole in the basement. The intruders then went upstairs to find Haley's room, where she was sleeping. Haley and Michaela Petit were tied by their hands and feet to their bedposts, and their heads were covered with pillowcases. Meanwhile, in the master bedroom, Jennifer Petit had fallen asleep. The intruders quietly entered the room and woke her up. Without much effort, they tied Jennifer's hands and feet. Feeling in control of the house, the intruders took their time to inspect it, even smoking cigarettes in the living room. After collecting jewelry, cash, and other valuables, they decided to leave. It seemed the ordeal was over for the Petit family as they heard the burglars leaving. However, their torment was far from over. After selling the stolen items at a pawn shop, and realizing they hadn't gotten as much money as expected, the ex-convicts, motivated by greed, decided to return to the house. They then found a check register with $40,000. They decided to steal $15,000. They also had stopped to fill a couple of gasoline cans before returning, as seen in surveillance camera footage. Back at the house, they told Jennifer their plan threatening to kill her entire family if she didn't cooperate. Desperate but thinking of her daughter's safety, Jennifer agreed to accompany Stephen to the bank the next morning. Meanwhile, Joshua took advantage of Jennifer's absence, entering Michaela's room, untying her, and beginning to undress her. He took photos with his cell phone and assaulted her, recording the act. Afterward, he took her to the bathroom to clean her, ensuring no DNA evidence was left then ordered her to put her pajamas back on and tied her up again. Evidence that Commissar Jevsky raped Michaela came from her autopsy, during which state medical examiner Dr. Wayne Carver found his DNA in her body. At the bank, everything seemingly went well, but Stephen failed to notice what Jennifer did while in the coup. Before approaching the teller, she wrote a note on a flyer asking for help. The note read, my name is Jennifer Hawk Petit. I need to withdraw $15,000 from my savings account. My family is in danger. Please call the police or they will be killed. 
The teller decided to give her the money, even though Jennifer had no identification. With the cash in hand, Jennifer left the bank to return to the car with her captor, while the bank employee immediately called the police to report the incident. The manager told the dispatcher of the 911 line that Hawk Petit had indicated that the home invaders were being niece and that she believed they only wanted money. The Cheshire police responded to the bank's report by assessing the situation and setting up a vehicle perimeter without revealing their presence. The police, now aware of the situation, observed from a distance without intervening. Back at the house, Joshua told his accomplice what he had done to Michaela, suggesting he could do the same to Jennifer. Without hesitation, Stephen subdued Jennifer, pressed her body to the ground, and began to undress her. William was able to hear his wife's assault upstairs. He yelled up and heard one of the invaders say, Don't worry, it's all gonna be over in a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, William Petit, regaining consciousness and hearing his wife's screams, managed to free himself and crawl to the basement stairs, eventually making it to the backyard. He later said, I thought, it's now or never because in my mind at that moment, I thought they were going to shoot all of us. In a minute, Joshua went to check on William, only to find that he had escaped. Hayes said in her confession that while he was raping Hawk Petit on the living room floor, Commissar Jevsky entered and announced that William had escaped. Hearing this, Stephen strangled Jennifer to death while continuing to assault her. Soon after, they heard William shouting for help. His neighbor, who initially didn't recognize him due to the injuries, called 911 immediately. Realizing the police would soon be called, the intruders decided to eliminate all evidence. Haves and Commissar Jevsky doused Jennifer's lifeless body and parts of the house, including the daughter's bedrooms and daughters themselves, with gasoline. Investigators would later find the accelerant on the Petit sisters' beds and on the clothing they were wearing. Hayes and Commissar Jevsky started a fire and fled the scene. Unaware that the authorities had blocked the area a few miles ahead, they collided with a police vehicle within five minutes. After they were surrounded by the police, the two perpetrators were pulled from their vehicle and arrested. They were immediately identified as ex-convicts. Meanwhile, the fire in the house was rapidly growing. An ambulance arrived and transported the gravely injured father, Dr. William Petit, to the nearest hospital. Shortly afterward, firefighters attempted to combat the blaze and upon extinguishing it, discovered a horrific scene in the remnants of the house. The first body found was that of Jennifer, completely churred with remnants of rope around her ankles. Upon reaching the second floor, they found Michaela tied to her bed, completely consumed by the fire. Haley, surprisingly, had managed to force her restraints and attempted to escape, but collapsed just a few meters away, having inhaled too much smoke. William had been able to free himself of his restraints, exit the house, and crawl to a neighbor's yard for help. The neighbor initially did not recognize him due to the severity of his injuries. Both Hayes and Commissar Jevsky confessed to the murders. Detectives testified that Hayes smelled of gasoline throughout her interrogation. Each assailant claimed that the other was the driving force and mastermind behind the home invasion. Commissar Jevsky also blamed William for the murders. In Commissar Jevsky's diary, which was later entered into evidence, he called William a coward and claimed that he could have saved his family if he wanted to. Stephen Hayes' trial began on September 13, 2010, with a jury of seven women and five men. The defense argued that Joshua Komisarjevsky was the mastermind behind the crime and responsible for escalating its violent nature, while prosecutors held that both Hayes and Komisarjevsky shared responsibility. On October 5, after about five hours of deliberation, the jury found Hayes guilty. The sentencing phase began on October 18, with the jury initially split over recommending life imprisonment or death. Hayes' defense argued that life imprisonment without parole would be a harsher punishment. On November 8, the jury recommended the death sentence for Hayes on each of the six capital felony counts. Hayes had previously attempted to negotiate a plea bargain for a life sentence, 
but prosecutors sought the death penalty. Dr. William Petit, the sole survivor, commented on the verdict, and the Connecticut State Judicial Branch offered post-traumatic stress assistance to jurors due to the disturbing nature of the trial. For the first time in state history, the Connecticut State Judicial Branch offered post-traumatic stress assistance to jurors who served for two months on the triple murder trial because they had been required to look at disturbing images and hear grisly testimony. On December 2, 2010, Hayes apologized for the pain and suffering he had caused the Petit family and added that death for me will be a welcome relief and I hope it will bring some peace and comfort to those who I have hurt so much. Judge John Blue imposed six death sentences and an additional 106 years for other crimes. However, Hayes' death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment in August 2015 when Connecticut abolished capital punishment. Joshua Komisarjevsky's trial began on September 19, 2011. His attorneys offered a guilty plea in exchange for a life sentence, but prosecutors aimed for the death penalty, arguing that Komisarjevsky was a confused man led by Hayes. Komisarjevsky was found guilty on October 13, 2011, and the jury recommended the death penalty on December 9, 2011. During his sentencing, Komisarjevsky spoke about his shame and hurt caused by the crime, insisting that he did not intend to kill anyone. Judge Blue set July 20, 2012, as Komisarjevsky's execution date, echoing his responsibility for the crime. However, like Hayes, Komisarjevsky's death sentence was converted to life imprisonment in August 2015 after Connecticut abolished the death penalty. The trials and subsequent sentencing of Hayes and Komisarjevsky marked a significant and harrowing chapter in Connecticut's legal history. The brutal nature of the crimes and the trial's emotional toll on all involved, including the jurors, highlighted the complexities and challenges of the legal system in dealing with such heinous acts. Dr. Petit's statements during the trials underscored the lasting impact of the crime on surviving family members and the community, which continues to honor the memory of the victims. The only survivor, Dr. William Petit, was discharged from the hospital four days after his admission to attend the funeral of his family. Haunted by guilt and the torment of having survived, he later established a foundation to help children and young victims of violence, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. Subsequently, as a member of the Republican Party, he ventured into politics and became a state representative. The murders of the Petit family left a deep impact on the community, which gathers annually to pay tribute to them. Questions remain among family members and the public about whether the authorities acted correctly in their response to the situation. The time spent by the authorities observing the situation from a distance could have been crucial in preventing the tragedy. This concludes today's case update. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it helps me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.